You know, we think of the Klan, often our mental picture of the Klan is from the 1920s, the second Klan, with their white robes, white hoods. There's a famous photograph of the Klan marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. That's not the Reconstruction Klan. They didn't have a lot of money back. They, they weren't having special uniforms or anything. They just wore whatever they could. So here's a Klansman who was captured with his outfit. It's not the image we have, but he's in his hooded attire, but it's not the white robe you usually think about. And the Klan put out warnings. Here's a uh, cartoon warning to Ohio officials to get out of uh, Alabama, I guess this was, the Ku Klux Klan threatening they'll be hanged if they don't uh, leave the state. People got warnings, they got written warnings, uh, et, et cetera. So, and the only way to describe the Ku Klux Klan and a kindred groups, you know, the Klan gets either blamed or credited, depending on where you're coming from, for all sorts of things. They're sort of like Al-Qaeda today, in the sense that everything that happens, it's Al-Qaeda doing this, Al-Qaeda doing that. Sometimes Al-Qaeda is doing it, sometimes other groups are doing it. Um, but the Klan and its kindred organizations, it was called the White League in uh, Louisiana, the Knights of the White Camellia, they, as they say, all sorts of local groups. But this is homegrown American terrorism. There is no other way to put it. Whatever you think about Al-Qaeda, that's what these guys were. Using violence for political ends, using violence to murder or intimidate individuals, governments, etc. The victims were carefully chosen as uh, Albert Morgan, who wrote a memoir, a carpetbagger who was in Mississippi wrote, only leaders were killed in Yazoo County, Mississippi, and only, local leaders, and only so many of them were necessary to convince Republicans their opponents would kill if necessary, that they had the power to kill, and there was none to forbid them or punish them afterwards. There were a few, there was one congressman murdered, there were a couple of state officials, but mostly it was local leaders, local officials, local Republican Party organizers, heads of the Union League, men who weren't that prominent, um, so it didn't cause a national uproar. If you kill a member of Congress, that becomes a national issue. Uh, many of them were not killed, but they were taken from their homes and whipped, threatened, their, their house burned, forced to leave. Um, violence was used to frighten black and white Republicans to try to prevent them from going to the polls and voting. Also to rally whites around the issue of race as the key dividing line and to insist that all white people ought to support the Democratic Party, and those who didn't were white scalawags were also victims of this kind of violence. So were people who weren't overtly political, like school teachers in black schools. Um, women, there's been more work lately. Um, Hannah Rosen wrote a very important book about violence toward women in Reconstruction, particularly women who were in interracial relationships would often be assaulted, whipped, uh, by the uh, Ku Klux Klan. Um, and a lot of this violence also has to do with labor, labor control, labor issues, people who, um, people who uh, uh, disputed labor contracts, blacks who managed to acquire land of their own were often targets of the Klan. You know, we sometimes think about, well, how come these people can't move up? You know, immigrants move up, move up in the social scale. Uh, there weren't groups murdering immigrants if they managed to set up their own business, right? There were people murdering black people if they managed to get ahead. This is a bit of a disincentive to, um, to economic um, mobility. Um, so my first point is violence was real. You know, if you go back to Birth of a Nation, we didn't actually see this clip, but part of Birth of a Nation, which is a glorification of the Ku Klux Klan, is based on the idea that it was sort of just playing on people's superstitions. Black people believed in ghosts, Klansmen got dressed up in these white sheets. They went around and they frightened them. Uh, that's not what they did. They, 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 you, th there was good reason to be frightened. It wasn't because you believed in ghosts. It was because there was real physical violence uh, being uh, perpetrated. And certainly the letters of Republican leaders nationally and at the state level are full of these complaints. For example, one white Republican wrote to Thaddeus Stevens from Alabama in 1868. We cannot vote without all said sorts of threats and intimidation. A perfect rule of terror. Terror, that's what's going on. 
As it, uh, our courts are mocks, all the officers full rebels, freed men are shot with impunity, all go off as justified homicide. Put us under strict military rule or turn us loose and give us a right to defend ourselves. One could go on, and in my book I give more examples, and certainly one of the great documents, not great, but one of the most revealing documents in American history is the congressional hearings on the Ku Klux Klan. In 1870, the House and Senate set up committees which went into the South and took hearings, and there's like 14 volumes of testimony about the operations of the Klan, which are all available on Nine Now, and you get a tremendous kaleidoscope of stories and um, impressions about what's going on in the South from this first-person uh, account. So um, one could go on, but really the question for us is why were these state governments so ineffective in combating violence? Some people say, well, why didn't the blacks rise up and fight? Well, there are many complicated reasons for that. One is that they weren't armed. You know, most white people had, had arms in the South. There was no real tradition of black violence against white people, despite all the uh, sort of white uh, fears about this under slavery. There were the people who had fought in the Union Army, but most African Americans had little experience with weaponry or, um, you know, or, or that kind of thing. But more to the point, um, the responsibility for maintaining order is not on the, is, does not rest on individual citizens, it rests on the government. If there were a group of guys riding around New York City shooting people at night, maybe there are for all I know, um, the, it wouldn't be, it, it's the government, it's the police, it's the, it's the militia or the National Guard that would have to suppress them. And why couldn't these governments, governments are supposed to be the, are supposed to have a monopoly of, of uh, weaponry or firepower, so to speak, but they didn't. Um, one problem was that all the governors under Reconstruction were white. There was one black governor for a few days, Pinchback in Louisiana, but all the other governors were white, and they were very reluctant to use, they raised, but they were very reluctant to use what were called Negro militias. Because in most of these states, there were very few white Republicans. And uh, to put, to arm blacks and send them out after these white, uh, uh, you know, night riders, they feared would lead to just an escalation and a wholesale racial warfare in the South, which they were not willing to do. Interestingly, in states where there were significant numbers of white Republicans, uh, Texas, Arkansas, North Carolina, they, they, the governors raised kind of inter, interracial militia units who did fight the Klan very effectively. Um, it seems that, the, uh, that having whites in the militia was essential to being willing to go out and use military means against these, uh, these, these violent criminals. The federal government, as we'll see in a minute, intervened from time to time to suppress violence, but you can't really expect the federal government to be a constant police force in local areas. Um, so, it, it was the, so the Reconstruction governments were in this difficult position of inspiring opposition as oppressors. Many whites felt they were trampling on their rights, but on the other hand, inviting resistance as weak. They were both seen as strong as, and weak at the same time. And uh, it put them in a kind of impossible uh, situation. And when blacks did resist, violence did escalate to a higher level. One of the most uh, kind of heinous uh, massacre that were in Reconstruction was the so-called Colfax Massacre in Louisiana in early 1873. Um, a tiny town, Colfax, Louisiana, which was under Republican control, and after a kind of disputed, the, the results of the 1872 election, they were disputed, and a black militia unit kind of occupied the town, and armed whites, the White League, kind of surrounded the town of Colfax and actually brought up a cannon and began bombarding the town, and uh, the, eventually the blacks surrendered because the city hall where they had been situated was on fire, and after surrendering, uh, somewhere between 60 to 100 African-American militiamen were murdered in cold blood by the White League. It was sort of like the Fort Pillow massacre in the Civil War. As we'll see in, a, in another lecture, 
the Colfax massacre, among other things, gave rise to a very important Supreme Court case, Crookshank v. Louisiana. Um, or no, it was U.S., sorry, U.S., a federal case, U.S. v. Crookshank. Just keep that in mind. We'll talk about it in a, in a, in a session or two, about the ability of the federal government to actually prosecute people for crimes like this. And in fact, it was one of the many steps in the Supreme Court's retreat from Reconstruction. We'll see that uh, next time. In 1874, the White League actually had an uprising in, Louisiana, in New Orleans to seize control of the state government of Louisiana. The capital was then in New Orleans. It later got moved to Baton Rouge. And federal troops came in and suppressed the White League uh, after three days of an armed uprising. And um, the result of that, uh, again, going back to our little subject of the public memory of Reconstruction, is still under dispute in, Lu in New Orleans today. There was a monument put up to the White League toward the end of the 19th century and what was called the Battle of Liberty Place, Battle of Liberty Place, where the White League fought to overturn the elected government of Louisiana. Something like 25 people, men were killed, uh, in that, in that uh, uprising. Um, in 1900 or so, a monument was put up to, in, to, com to glorify the White League. In the 1990s, the monument was taken down and put into storage. And the mayor said, well, it needs to be repaired. And nobody knew, but I, it was never put back up. And there's a, there was a whole big dispute. Should we put back the monument to the White League. I, don't, I think it's still in storage. They can't quite figure out what to do with it because even though its supporters said, no, no, it had nothing to do with race, this thing. This was just about oppressive government. The, um, the plaque, the language on the, uh, on the monument said uh, that um, the national election of 1876 recognized white supremacy and gave us back our state. So to say it's not about race, Seems odd, since it's a monument to white supremacy, it says on the monument itself. Anyway, the dispute is still going on about what to do with, if, I don't know, if anyone's down in New Orleans, see if you can find out what happened to the uh, monument to the Battle of Liberty Place and the White League. Here's an example of the intense hatred of Louisiana. This is a cartoon, Murder of Louisiana, Sacrificed on the Altar of Radicalism. This is Louisiana as a somewhat naked white woman with two black men holding her from either end, and there is the governor, Kellogg, having cut out the heart. He's holding the heart of Louisiana in his hand. Uh, Grant is sitting up there doing nothing. Other southern states are on the right lamenting this. South Carolina is here in chains, and this is the image, racial and other ways. The, the two blacks are almost in this, you know, monkey-like, they're portrayed that way. The murder of Louisiana, and that's the kind of this is soon before the White League uh, uprising. Um, so the opposition, this kind of opposition, which produced the violence, as well as other forms of opposition to Reconstruction, what's interesting about it is it kind of combined overt racism with also a kind of class critique of Reconstruction. Um, so for example, one Klan leader in South Carolina says, and I mentioned this before, the legislature was controlled by those who own no land and pay no taxes. Not true, by the way. The state is now ruled by those with no interest in its prosperity. See, it's not just that they're black, but that they're poor, which is bad enough. And in fact, in our JNAP, in JNAP, there's this editorial from The Nation, a magazine which was founded in 1865, their 150th anniversary is coming up soon, by abolitionists to defend Reconstruction. But by this time, and we'll see in a minute, other Northerners are retreating. Socialism in South Carolina is the title. It's not race. Socialism in South Carolina is the problem with Reconstruction. Poor people are running the government, taxing the rich, and that is, it's class as well as race. It's a combination of, of these two uh, notions of, of who should be on top and who should not. 